Hello, good evening, welcome. <laughs> Isn't technology incredible? Hello everybody, thanks for, for joining us on, uh, on the intellect, intellect online. Maybe you're watching on your phone for uh, a special part of this year's uh, Slapstick Festival, a virtual festival. Uh, as it has to be this year, hopefully the last time it's virtual and next year we'll see you all back in the live venues. And tonight is a special event because, and you can see him, there he is, look, no, no, he's, he's, he's that way, there he is. Uh, this is my friend, of course, Graham Garden. Graham, good evening. Good evening. Nice to be here. Isn't it nice to be <laughs> here? Yes. Uh, Graham, you may not, viewers, you may not know this, Graham and I live in the same house. I'm just on a different floor. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's why we don't get any howl back o over the audio. That's right. How are you, sir? How is your lockdown? I'm all right. I'm I'm well locked down. It's um it's been uh, an absolute joy from start to finish. <laughs> hasn't it just? Hasn't yeah. it just? And uh, have have you had your jab? I've had one of my jabs. Yes, yes. And right. uh, the uh, jabbers will be getting at me again in a few weeks' time. I expect. Oh, those bloody jabbers. Did you see that clip on the press today of Dolly Parton getting hers? Yes, excellent. Good I song. Thought, yeah, it was. And I thought, as I often think whenever I see anything with her, I think, oh, she seems like a good egg. Yeah, yes. she is, I think. <laughs> good. <laughs> I mean, were this another era, we could have gone on all sorts of uh, flights of fancy. Graham, tonight we are talking about your uh, comic heroes. Now, when mm. one is asked to compile a list of favorites of anything, I, I often find it quite difficult. To, how was the task for you? It is very difficult because there are, it's not the ones you choose, it's the ones you leave out. Because obviously you, uh, you would like to choose hundreds of, of comic heroes that, that people who've made me laugh and have I've really given me great joy over the years. A lot of them I've worked with, Rob. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so have you. When you uh, said uh, when you say a lot of them I've worked with, Rob, was that yeah. your lo lovely way of saying I'm one of them, or were you just saying to me, Rob, I've, I've worked with a lot of them. You might have too. Yeah, I, uh, as have you. Is, is what I meant. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I right, know. There is a chance for some for a lovely moment there, but we, we, we'll 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 let it go. Well, well, um, hang on. We'll see how we go. All right then. Okay. It's a long night. Um, <laughs> and tell me this. Are you one of those people, um, oh, Dennis, Dennis Norden, are you one of those people who um, can, even if you don't find something funny, you can appreciate the craft of the comedian? Yeah, I'm uh, probably not a great laugher, so I do appreciate things more than I laugh at them. A few things make me laugh out loud, but um, a lot of the time I'm really appreciating the, the, the comedy and, and enjoying it, certainly, yeah. um, and finding it funny. I, I can watch almost any comedian. Sometimes my wife will find me watching something that perhaps she doesn't consider to be funny, and I wouldn't say it's that funny, but she'll say, why are you watching that? And I say, well, I just I want to see what they're doing, you know, see how they go about it. I think there are two sorts of, of uh, enjoyment or feeling that I have watching things. One is when you watch somebody do something that amuses you and you think, I wish I was up there doing that. <laughs> And the other is watching somebody do something and thinking, I wish I could do that because it's just something beyond your skill set and yes. is, is wonderful and, and impressive. I um, always love that. You know, you, you, you can often watch a comedian and you know what they're going to do and they mm. do it so beautifully. You laugh and it's wonderful. Yeah. I, I really savor those moments, though, when someone takes you completely by surprise. And, and I always think of Harry Hill in the first time I saw Harry Hill live, his logic and the way he went all over the place that always stays in my mind is, wow, there's no way yeah. I'd have predicted that. No, he's terrific. Now, he's not on my list of heroes, but he ought to be. So but we'll, um, we'll give him an, an honorable, an honorable mention. Honorable Let's start mention. off then with your first one. Now, this is a performer that I was not familiar with. No, um, it's um, a silent star uh, called Lloyd Hamilton. And this is a slightly mischievous choice because he's not really a hero of mine, but he was a hero to apparently everybody else. Chaplin said uh, he was the one actor I'm jealous of. Buster Keaton said Lloyd Hamilton was one of the funniest men in pictures. Max Sennett said Lloyd Hamilton had it all, comic motion. 
Charlie Chase apparently would say, how would Ham Hamilton play this before he went on to do a scene? Harold Lloyd loved him. And very little of his work remains because a lot of it was destroyed in a fire and he died quite young. Um, but as the years go by, more and more of it is being found. But um, what remains at the moment is, is not that impressive, but you wonder why all these people found him so terrific. Uh, so we're, we're going to watch it and, and we're going to go, oh. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Kevin Brownlow, Kevin Brownlow, the film historian, has a rather wicked theory that Chaplin and Keaton and Harold Lloyd and everybody were so fed up with being asked who their favourite comedian <laughs> was that they clubbed together and said, let's pick somebody out of a hat. And they just hit on Lloyd Hamilton's name and they all agreed to say it was him uh, for no apparent reason. <laughs> That's very funny to say. I think it's also to say, a bit unfair. <laughs> it's very funny to say very little remains of his work. But I think when you watch the clip, you do wonder. Oh. <laughs> so let's <laughs> let's have a look then, and and we'll we'll discuss him after. Here he is. This is uh, Graham's first choice. It is Lloyd yeah, it, Hamilton. It, it, yeah. There we are. There you are. <laughs> and that's Chaplin and Keaton's favourite comic. Yeah. I think there may be something in your theory. Um, <laughs> it was interesting, wasn't it? The first thing that struck me was how long that subtitle stayed up. I mean, were they slow readers in those days? That, 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 the first one stayed up for what seems like a lifetime. You couldn't yeah, I guess see... they probably were. <clears throat> you couldn't yes that was interesting to watch wasn't it i mean i what give me give me your critique of that then for the comedy well, he very, of it he was funny physically and did that very sort of strange camp walk um and i think some of his gags were rather more elaborate than just chasing a woman with a butterfly in her leg yeah uh, 
but uh, and he had that sort of funny flat hat on his head that that was constantly looking as if it was about to fall off. Yeah. Uh, uh. um, but uh, th that was the kind of character he played in the films that I've seen of his. And um, as I say, they're, they're not wonderful by any means, but there is something there that you can imagine, given full reign, he might have achieved something even better. Yeah, and it is it is fascinating to, to see him cited by Chaplin and Harold Lloyd and Max Sennett. It's worth seeing just for mm. that and, and to think yeah. what what did they what did they see now Buster Keaton was a fan of his uh, and he's your next choice when when did you discover his work Buster Keaton I really I think discovered at uh, Cambridge when uh, I was in the footlights and uh, Tim Brooke Taylor awarded a Buster Keaton film to be uh, shown one evening at the uh, footlights club and um, it was the first time I'd seen it with a, a live audience around. And I think that was an eye opener, partly watching a silent movie with an audience. Which how, course, how, how, how did it play to the audience? Very well. And there were a lot of big laughs, um, whereas one was used to seeing the, uh, the silent comedians at home on the television, usually with an American voiceover explaining how they were um, you know, he was going to be very funny in this sequence, although he died three months later of <laughs> yeah, drink. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So uh, it was, uh, that was wonderful. And then later on, obviously, to be able to catch up with more and more Keaton stuff and mm. going to the Slapstick Festival, of course, is an absolute treat because you see the, the things uh, full blast on a big screen with an orchestra. Mm, and mm. hopefully we, we, next we... year that'll be back. With live music, and and if yeah. you like, if you like live accompaniment to uh, silent films, stay right where you are. Absolutely. So, what is the? I don't mean stay right where you are until next year's festival. Stay right where you are within the confines of this broadcast. Which clip have you chosen of Buster Keaton? Buster Keaton. It's um, a, a later one. Um, it's a talkie, in fact. Um, because uh, I, I think everyone, well, not everyone, but um, I'm very familiar with a lot of his earlier stuff. And this was something I hadn't seen before. Um, and um, it was a film called General Nuisance. And in it, he does a dance routine. And um, he is uh, in 1941, so he was getting on a little bit then. But certainly Buster still has it. OK, let's take a look from 1941, General Nuisance. This is Buster Keaton.
Oh, that was lovely, wasn't it? I just love that perfectly timed double take he does at the end when he realizes who he's dancing with. That and you've never lovely. seen so many spittoons in a scene before, have you? No, no, that's <laughs> true. That's true. That was that was lovely. I, I love the um, the getting the dance wrong. You don't you don't see yeah. that very often. You know that I thought that was that was very nice. And that was him in a in a, a talkie. He was pr mostly known for the silent. Am, am I right? He was, yeah, yeah. And his talkies were not quite so highly regarded and um, he didn't like doing the talkies because uh, there were too many writers involved right, right. he said once you had dialogue everybody wanted to be a writer and so everybody the producers and the director and everybody else were writing jokes um, and he lost really control of the the concept which he could do much more purely in, in silent film and also in that clip I think it's interesting he is the stone face, um, every uh, very internal. The 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 woman who dances with him is pulling every stunt in the book, you know, pulling faces and doing funny gestures and stuff, and putting on voices. And he is doing his thing, which I always love, is looking as if he hopes nobody sees him. He hopes nobody's looking, and you know, <laughs> if he falls over, he gets up again like a cat. Yeah. Uh, and carries on. He does. Chaplin falls over. He turns it into a little dance. <laughs> but uh, I love that about Keaton. Now it's interesting talking about um, a performer going from the the silent era into talkies, because your next clip is uh, the brilliant Laurel and Hardy, and it, it's it's a silent. Now they they. I don't know to what degree you're an authority on, on Laurel and Hardy, but they seem to make a fantastic transition from silent in, into talkies. They did, and uh, I think, A, they had good voices. Um, Stan Laurel had that funny English North Country accent. Yeah. And um, Oliver Hardy was a singer. Um, so they, they, they had the voices, they could do that. And also it helped the relationship that had already been built up in, in, in the silent movies of, of the, uh, the classic one that Morecambe and Wise talk about, the, the, the idiot and the idiot who thinks he's clever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they did, they, they, tra they transformed beautifully into, into their sound movies. And... Um, yeah, in this one, it, it is one of their silent ones, and it's a bit unusual because the uh, the clip we're going to see is a sort of high jeopardy. They're in, on top of a skyscraper, which is not the kind of uh, trick they usually did. Um, and in it, they play two convicts who are escaping. They've changed into their day clothes. Mm. But during this process, uh, Stan Laurel has acquired a live crab in his trousers. <laughs> And has put on Oliver Hardy's trousers, and uh, Oliver is in stands, and they are trying to change their trousers back, and trying to find somewhere discreet to do it, um, and that le leads to all kinds of trouble with uh, the police, apart from anything else. Okay, well, well, we'll have a look at it, and I should say before we start that this is going to be a little bit special because the musical accompaniment is going to be played live because in the Netherlands. Right now, Dan van den Herk is waiting to accompany this clip for us here at the Slapstick Festival live as it happens. So it's Dan van den Herk live at the piano in the Netherlands accompanying Laurel and Hardy in a clip from Liberty. Thank you. 
Well, wasn't that wonderful? And thank you, Dan. That's Dan van den Herk, who was playing that for us live. Very uh, good. Thank as you. you're watching this, let's let's give Dan a round of applause. That was that was that was lovely to watch. It's um, it is remarkable, isn't it, that they had the the, the perfect physicality for the silence, and yeah. vo vocally, their vocals yeah. were the match of their physicality. I mean, that's rare. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and. Um, and, and, and you know that clip if you love them as much as i do it's very scary to see them up on that building yeah yeah i mean when you when you watch them in the talkies and i'm far more familiar with the with the spoken stuff the um sort of archetypal nature of their relationship it's it's timeless isn't it it it, it yeah. here we are in 2021 and the way that they relate to each other rings just as true when they're going on trips with their wives or they're mm. trying to do some kind of a thing, you know, get a job done. Did you see the recent, there was the film uh, of them with yes, um, yes. John C. Riley, ruined, I thought, by um, that uh, Manchester comedian. Um, I, I forget <laughs> his name, but uh, otherwise, yeah. otherwise a successful film, but maybe, maybe that's just me. Very good, yes. No, I enjoyed that. It was very good. John C. Riley was fantastic in it. Wasn't he? he, John C. Riley, was good. I, I agree. No, I thought, I thought Steve was. Uh, well, they both were. I mean, good lord. Yeah, but they yeah. really, you really felt for a lot of that film that you were watching the the real two. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think they absolutely nailed the relationship between them, and that kind of relationship worked on the screen as well as off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very true, very true. And and it pains me to, to praise Steve, but there we are. We I mean, move... In my heroes to represent the double acts because obviously Morecambe and Wise and people like that I, I grew up with watching yeah. in the 60s, 70s, Cannonball, all sorts of people who uh, I've enjoyed over the years, but uh, we're probably more familiar with their their best stuff. So yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going for the for the slightly less familiar pictures. OK, we're going to start to move now into performers that you knew personally and that you worked with. And I'm excited about your first choice here. And it's Spike Milligan. Spike, yes, um, he was a force of nature. Um, I did a series with him called uh, Ask a Funny Answer, which was an early attempt, I think, by somebody to try and do something like, I'm sorry, having a clue on television. And there was Terry Wogan was in the chair. Uh -huh. Um, one team was me and Spike Milligan, and um, the other team was Willie Rushton, and um, I can't remember who it was now, but uh, it was a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. And it was um, it was a very strange uh, experience, and it was very unrehearsed, underrehearsed, and unprepared, and um, I never really saw the, the light of day after the first series. And would would Spike go out there without a safety net, as it were? To what extent would he prepare, and to what extent would he just? As far as I could see, he was totally unprepared and just went out there and and uh, you know, off the top of his head. It was difficult to prepare for anyway, and um, mm. he he certainly was not in a mind to do that. But he he knew that he could just go out there and be Spike, um, and uh, the rest of us couldn't. <laughs> 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 Alfred Marx was the other team member. I remember. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. And this that was a show then, and it didn't gel. In it, it did. It didn't fly. It, it didn't. It didn't really. I mean, uh, you know, um, Spike's uh, sort of Q series on on TV was uh, it was it was very hit and miss. But when he hit, it was yeah. sublime. Yeah. 
Um, and when he missed, uh, he knew he was missing and was very funny about it. Yeah, he did, he didn't. It didn't seem to bother him. He seemed to take. No. You often find that a lot of comedians, if they, if something's not working, they almost uh, get off on it. They almost get off on the energy yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but he he certainly was. Uh, uh, you know, you felt that he would have been perfectly happy doing it without an audience, probably on his own in a room somewhere. Right. <laughs> and what's the clip that you've chosen for us? Well, this is, uh, let me just get it right. It, it's Spike uh, miming, in fact, to an old uh, musical song with uh, John Bluthall called uh, Everything's Fresh Today, which was originally sung by Jack Hodges, the Raspberry King, apparently. You'll probably find out why in a minute. Okay, but it right. is just, uh, they took an old song, a silly old song, and added a, 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 a level of madness and uh, almost threat <laughs> to it. It is very weird. And okay. uh, it, I hope it makes you laugh. Okay, let's take a look. Here's Spike Milligan. <laughs> I've never seen that before. That was uh, so. That so who, who was the guy miming to the singing? Do you know that who that was? Bluthall. Oh, that right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very oh, funny how, actor. Yeah. Look, look how long it was. You know, there, there was no, no know, thought of. Isn't it? Shall, shall we shorten this a bit? The, it was, and I loved the look at one point that Spike, yeah, I know. quite a tender <laughs> look between the it, two it of is them. Very weird. The whole thing. It's a very, very long, drawn-out farting joke, but uh, made extraordinary. How, what extent do you think Spike's absurdist view of the world was, was uh, coloured by his war experiences? That's my, in my amateur psychologist role, it seems as if he came back from that and saw the futility of uh, yeah, I think everything. He thought that certainly felt that um, uh, what he wrote about his war experiences and his um, imaginary war experiences he yes, uh, yes. yeah I think uh, he, he did have a tough time and I think um, he certainly suffered afterwards uh, yeah. whether it was directly as, as a result or if he was particularly vulnerable you know when he first went out there um, but I, I think his contribution was that he unleashed the uh, the inner lunatic from a lot of people who, who uh, you know, relished that crazy kind of humour. And yeah. uh, The Goon Show, which he was very largely responsible for, yes. was a huge influence. Would he write those single-handedly or, or did Eric Sykes? He wrote with some with Eric Sykes, yeah. Right. yeah. And, and also there was another writer, his name I can't remember, Right. Uh, he wrote quite a lot with in the early days. Um, my my favourite, the... my favourite goon show joke that comes to mind now is, uh, "Have you got, have you got the time?" And he says, "Yes, I wrote it down." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now it's it's a small a small step from Spike Milligan to your next choice, the uh, the great, the the revered uh, Peter Sellers. Tell us about Peter yes. Sellers. Um, Peter Sellers, I uh, you know first heard on the radio, obviously in the Goon Show. Um, then um, I suppose when I was at school, I heard his his records that that he did songs for Swinging Sellers, yeah. and yeah. Uh, some of his uh, spoken uh, pieces, sketches that he did on on record, critics and things like that with Irene Handel. Yeah. And I just loved the, the the richness of the characterizations that he was able to to do, um, and characters that, that didn't sound like each other. You know, it didn't sound like him doing it. Yeah. He, he, um, he, he would lose himself, wouldn't he? Absolutely. Totally in, yeah. in the character. And did he not say that there was no Peter Sellers? That he had no uh, personality? He did. Yes, and uh, he seems to have been. Uh, to have had a personality, but a fairly strange one, I think. Um, yeah, from what yeah. one gathers. But you, you, you must on form. So, sorry, he was, sorry, sorry, Graham. I, I, I spoke across you. No, no, no. I was just going to say, on form, he was absolutely magnificent. Oh, I think he he was a, a, a genius. However, you want to define genius, he he was. Uh, 
there was something there's something sexy about him in the, in the broader sense of the word. You know, there's something yeah. exciting about him. There was something a little bit dangerous about him. But he, he was an odd man. You must have known uh, Victor Spinetti. Yes, I knew. Well, I, I knew Vic a little bit towards the, towards the end of his life. And he would tell me stories because I'd, I'd sit there at dinner with him and say, oh, tell me about this, tell me about that. And he said when they were doing, I think they were doing one of the Pink Panther films, the one where, where he had that scene with Vic where he said, I want a run because Vic mm. played the concierge. Yeah, and he, yeah. sa he, said, he said that one night they're in the hotel and Sellers called him up and said, take me out to dinner. And he said, OK. And for the whole night, Sellers took on the personality of a gangster's mole. And, and he was flirting with the waiters. But he didn't let it drop from the minute he was picked up until the minute he, he said goodbye to him at the end of the night. Yeah which is, by anybody's standards, strange behaviour. Strange, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, and we shan't have any of it here. Now, tell us about the, um, tell us about the clip. Well, I mean, uh, I loved his early uh, Inspector Clouseau's, and uh, sadly, I think he, his performance sort of went off towards the end when he no longer seemed to be engaging properly with the characters he played. But in his early days, as I said, he was magnificent. And I think the best example to show his range is uh, is uh, Doctor Strangelove, how yeah, I learned yeah. to stop worrying and love the bomb, where he played three separate characters. And um, if you'll bear with us, we'll we'll have a look at each of them now. He played uh, the British um, RAF guy Mandrake, who is trapped with uh, Mad uh, General Ripper who has launched an attack on Russia, a nuclear attack, and locked himself in the control center so nobody can get in. Just him and this poor, <laughs> bewildered RAF guy. Uh, then in the Sellers plays the American president who has the job of phoning the <laughs> Russian uh, president and explaining what has happened. Yeah. And then he plays Dr. Strangelove, who is the strange presidential advisor, scientific advisor who was brought over from, from Germany at the end of the war. And there's a kind of a cross between uh, Hitler, Henry Kissinger and, <laughs> and a Dalek, really. Um, so he plays three very different characters, all of them beautifully. And uh, they could be played by totally different actors. Yeah, well, well, okay, well, let's take a look. And anybody who hasn't seen this before, you're in for a real treat. Dr. Strangelove. Oh, that's glorious. That's, that's just, that's just wonderful. That makes me want to go and watch it again. <laughs> it is a fantastic film. Oh, yeah, Stanley Kubrick. Of course, directing. Indeed, it. yes. And yes. we stay with with Peter Sellers. He he skips from a Stanley Kubrick film into a BBC sitcom. In your next clip, yes, my next uh, hero is Eric Sykes, who uh, we mentioned uh, helped to uh, write the Goon Show and uh, wrote some wonderful scripts and did some wonderful special shows and also his own uh, sitcom series. Um, with Hattie Jakes and uh, the other regular was Derek Guiler who played yeah. the, the policeman who always popped in uh, and on this occasion uh, Peter Sellers uh, offered to come in and appear as a guest in the show and they wrote a part for him and um, I believe the BBC objected because they said they couldn't afford him and uh, he said he would do it for nothing uh, to which they objected even more and said, we, we don't employ actors for nothing. Anyway, eventually he did manage to do it. Um, and um, I think it was a little bit of, of uh, fun they were having together. And there certainly shows. Uh, and there this, are many this is the 70s. famous outtakes. Yeah. And this would, this would be the 1970s, yes? Yes, yes. So Sellers then would have been what, at, at the height of his Pink Panther fame. Yes, it'll be in the middle of that. Yeah. So this this was a big deal. This was a, a big, very big, deal, big, yeah. big film star coming in to yeah. to guess. Well, let, let's have a look at it, and, and we we can discuss more after this. So Peter Sellers with Hattie Jakes and uh, Eric Sykes. And Peter Sellers is uh, after Hattie Jakes, but they have to pretend that she's married to Eric Sykes. I see, and not brother and, and in sister. In fact, she is yeah. his identical twin sister. Right. Okay. Let, okay. Let's let's take a look. Hmm. 
oh have i lost you hang on where are you there you are i lost you for a second that was uh, that was just lovely and you you oh sorry hang on a minute um there you go that's my daughter you see this is what happens when you you don't get professionals in there we are um <laughs> Well, it shows it's live. You, you were saying in the intro to that, uh, Graham, that um, it, there are some famous outtakes from that scene. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, Sellers and, and uh, Sykes could uh, hardly keep a straight face with some of that. I thought they were going to go when the telephone <clears throat> wouldn't break. But, yeah. um, but also you saw a bit in that of, of the lovely gangling physicality that, that Eric Sykes had, the sort of miming trying to get his message across, um, which always used to make me laugh whenever he's desperately trying to to physically get himself out of problems. Yeah, that's a, that's a lovely clip. That's a very special clip. I'm glad you chose that. Um, back to America now, uh, coming slightly more up to date. My, my God, it's still a long time ago. Um, oh, oh, that's depressing. Uh, Steve Martin. What have you chosen from Steve Martin? Uh, Steve Martin, um, I think, is, well, certainly early Steve Martin is wonderfully funny. Later on, he did a lot of sort of uh, um, remakes of uh, family comedies. Uh, but I think uh, his early uh, crazy stuff was was uh, was terrific. And uh, especially this film, The Man with Two Brains, mm. um, which he wrote and, and starred in. Um, and... Uh, there's a little clip of which uh, is a great visual and verbal gag um, where he uh, he knocks somebody down in his car. I think that's all you need to know. At this OK. Point. All right. Let, let's take a look at it. The man with two brains. <laughs> Here is Steve Martin. That's a lovely clip. It's a great gag. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? Yeah, because <laughs> it kind of goes vump. Vump, vump. That's uh, that's very nice. What? But you. What about? So let's talk about some of his later films. I mean, again, I, I'm falling into that same trap of seeing his later stuff. And the example I'm going to give is quite a while ago now. But I thought uh, Bowfinger was a wonderful film. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I think that was the last one that I sort of <laughs> rated very highly. But I, I must say I haven't really seen all his his sort of family comedy ones that originally starred Spencer Tracy and people like that. Yeah, um, yeah, but I guess um, it's the uh, maybe it's the finance structure of the, the movie industry that uh, that will get a bigger audience than uh, some of his wilder material. Um, and also, how long? How long can you keep on making these? Because he had a run of such essential films you know, with the jerk, the man with two brains. Um, yeah. And then right, you know, right through to to Roxanne. More recently, what he's been doing—it's a wonderful show. It's on Netflix. Is is a is an evening with himself and Martin Short. Have, have you ever seen that? Right. No, I haven't seen that. Oh, that's on Netflix. You should watch look. that. Oh, it's yeah. it's it's joyous. It it, it really is. Um, speaking of joyous, here's a comedian who brought so much joy. He is the epitome of that saying. I laugh when I look at him. Uh, who is it, Graham? Who is it? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you. It's Tommy Cooper. <laughs> I should have known, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, Tommy Cooper. <laughs> yeah, you do laugh when you look at him because he, he looks as if he has no right to be funny at all. It's <laughs> this shambling man who's just coming off the street, decided <laughs> to put a silly hat on. <clears throat> um, but his comedy, it, again, it, it's... it's um, it's sort of knife edge stuff. You feel that he, he's, it's a balancing act and he's about to topple over and it's all going right. to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And it never does. He, he pulls it back and uh, is um, masterfully in control of, of things that he seems to be struggling to, to cope with. And you, you, you must have come across him over the years. I never know. I never met him and I never you, worked you, with him. What? I'm staggered that you, you no. never met him. No, I didn't, and um, wow. it's, it's a great shame because I'd love to have, have uh, asked him if he was as, as mean as they said he was. 
He used to uh, do that amazing thing, didn't he? Didn't he for a while open his live show with the sound of him stuck in the dressing room and he, he couldn't get out of the dressing room? Yes. And you, you'd hear it over the tannoys, him trying to, and he couldn't get out, and the audience were all in hysterics. The, 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 the clip you've chosen, it says here, duck trick, etc. Yeah, now that's about what it is. Okay, well, let's have a look. Tommy Cooper, duck trick, <coughs> etc. <laughs> Here's a pack of cards. Now, I'd like something here now at random. <coughs> Mr. Random. <laughs> Would you think of any card you like in the pack, so we don't tell me? <laughs> think of any cards. No, just think of one. <laughs> Have you thought of one? Right, now this is my number matter. If you don't mind, I don't matter. <laughs> I'll put the cards in there. I've seen a duck do that before, but be fair, like... <laughs> Hold your cards up. No, correct. No, no. Just, uh, just a delight. I think he was probably one of the first people I ever saw on television. Actually, was he really? Um, he was, he was uh, going even then. <laughs> even, even way back then. Now, you, much to my surprise, I tell yeah. you what, this will be a nice clip in its own right. That moment when I, I gave the big build up and I said, "Tell us who it is," and you leant forward to look. I'd like to have that made into a clip. Um, you, you, you never met uh, Tommy Cooper, much to my surprise, but surely you had all sorts of dealings with uh, the Pythons, maybe before they were Pythons, while they were Pythons. Tell us about that. Yes, and um, they, they have been uh, comedy heroes off and on of mine over the years because I, I knew many of them at Cambridge when I was a student, and uh, uh, in fact, all of them. Uh, shortly thereafter um, and they again carried on that sort of tradition of, of uh, surreal uh, freewheeling comedy that uh, uh, I suppose Spike Milligan started and um, they did some wonderfully funny stuff and particularly their movies and uh, out of them the life of Brian I think is the uh, is the jewel in the crown and you've uh, chosen a, a particular scene. Which scene have you chosen? Well, I've chosen um, a scene which is um, a proper schoolboy joke, <laughs> basically. Um, there's nothing, nothing deep in this one at all. And this is a Monty Python, and it's from Life of Brian. Uh, please enjoy Biggus Dickus. <laughs> That's a great clip, isn't it? <laughs> well, not very grown up, but very amusing. Oh, but it's uh, it's hard to imagine that scene being written. It's 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 hard to picture them there. Uh, mm. Where where do you begin? Oh, I, I, it's 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 very impressive. It's wrong to have favourites, Graham. But who's your favourite Python? My favourite Python. Gosh, I don't know. I think um, John is the kind of figurehead. Eric's the one who seems to sort of busy himself and, and uh, get things done in the background. Uh, Mike is just the nicest. <laughs> Terry Jones is the one who I think had more of the Python spirit than anybody else in terms of the, the comedy. Yeah. And Terry Gilliam was a great brand. I think the branding of Python was very much down to yeah. Terry Gilliam and his visuals. 
So um, I think they just were a brilliant team. Very diplomatic. The <laughs> next choice is one that I have not uh, come across before. This is the Jovers. Who, who are or were the Jovers? Well, these, um, I'm aware that I haven't chosen very many women uh, in my comedy heroes, and I, I have enjoyed, loved funny women like Hattie Jakes and people like Joyce Grenfell in the past and so on. And there's a woman in this act, it's a man and a wife. And this is uh, to salute my heroes, who are the people who do their comedy without getting terribly famous, who go around the circuits of cabaret and stage doing maybe just the same act year after year, but perfecting it and getting it so pin dot accurate that you just marvel <laughs> at the way they do it. And the Jovers was such an act. They, they did cabaret in America mostly. Um, they did get onto the Ed Sullivan show, but uh, never made it huge. Um, so to all the people who, who are working away, doing their thing night after night, um, they're my heroes and the Jovers represent them. Okay, let's take a look. Here they are, the Jovers. I didn't know what to wear. I certainly didn't. <laughs> Where'd you get that? It fell off a truck. <laughs> there was an old lady wearing it at the time. Ladies and gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. What you're about to see. Oh, no way. <laughs> oh, no. I couldn't bear it. <laughs> what you're about to see. Yes. We've been practicing for 15 years. Yes, it's really true. Now we're both too old to do it. We keep pretending we're not. <laughs> oh, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> well, you keep laughing at this. This is not going to be funny. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> I'm going to... What are we going to do? I'm glad you asked me that. Yes. You see, we're going to do some tricks on the table. Oh. It's not even my birthday. Now, I don't suppose you've done it before. Never. I see. Mm -hmm. Not on a table. <laughs> that size. <laughs> All right, come here. over here. All right? Okay. Just step right there. Okay, just stand still for a oh, minute. Oh, that's right. Yes. yes. From now on, yes. this is going to be physical. Oh. <laughs> this is a very serious moment. Yes, I can tell by their faces. <laughs> a very tense moment. I feel the tense. Right, now yes. just do everything I tell you. Right, now when I count three, yes. you're going to jump on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy. You just step on here. One, two, three, lads. Okay. I'm so excited. <laughs> okay, here we go. Drum up. One, two. Oh. <laughs> Is this the tense moment? No, I think it's the serious moment. <laughs> oh, don't laugh at this. Why not? Well, it's not funny. Well, it feels funny. I'll just ignore it. You're yes. Right. Okay, now pretend nothing happened. Nothing happened. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, spring. You're kidding. <laughs> Come on, spring. <laughs> You're not springing. Spring will be a little late. <laughs> Those are my knees. Okay. You like? I can see everything from up here. Oh, I'm sure you can, yes. You can see everything. Okay. Yes. Now here we go. Yes. When I count three, yes. you're going to fly through the air like a bird. <laughs> Pointy shoes again, aren't you? I think I've come to a dead end. Move your foot. It's my <laughs> Ah, 
that was remarkable. I've never seen that before. <laughs> it goes on. It gets much more dangerous after that. But you know what you were saying about doing the, the same act for mm -hmm. years and just getting it. I mean, there was so much in that, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it's very funny because uh, you just don't believe that they're going to do it. <laughs> they suddenly do. I, I love I love how how tight that was and and the mm. timing. You see that when you watch old uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. You know when they coming from having done sort of four five six shows a day, they were on that circuit, yeah. weren't they? There's there's clips of them doing their kind of patter stuff, and it is so there. Mm. I mean, it's incredible, and you can only achieve that through through doing it and doing it and doing it and doing yeah. it and, and doing it. I'm so glad you chose that clip. But what, what happened to them? Um, that clip I first saw online, somebody put it up on, on Twitter or somewhere. And um, she uh, wrote uh, to the person who'd put it up on Twitter saying, thank you for showing it. Um, her husband had died a few years ago and it was great to see uh, that their act was remembered. Was that that was her husband in the clip? And that was her husband in the in the thing. Yeah, there, there were a couple. Wow. Well, um, I'm, she I'm... was very touched by the fact that it had been uh, revived. That that was very very impressive. Uh, as mm -hmm. is our next choice, who is is a friend of of, of both of ours, I, I believe. The the wonderful, kind of unique Tim Vine. Tim Vine. Yeah. I mean, he's. Uh, kind of on his own with comics these days because he is not trying to uh, observe the world and say how it could be better or isn't it silly or uh, you know uh, you know how do you feel about things he just goes out and tries to be funny and succeeds yeah, yeah. is extremely funny and this is a clip of him doing a little visual routine which does make me laugh enormously and um it's not his puns. It's uh, something completely different. Okay. <laughs> well, we, we, time is, is against us because we want to have a Q&A before yep. we finish. So, so let's press on. Let, let's enjoy Tim and we'll have a little chat about it uh, after we've seen it. Tim Vine. Ladies and gentlemen, um, if there's one thing this act needs, um, well, it needs a few things, let's be honest. <laughs> but let's not break into the discussion groups about it. Um, it's, uh, it's ventriloquism. Um, so can we have, let's just get this the correct height for the, uh, the uh, ventriloquist doll. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please welcome to the stage the ventriloquist doll. Let's hear it for him, yes. What's your name? My name is Clowney. It's best to watch his mouth. <laughs> what have you been doing today, Clowney? Well, I've been doing ventriloquism. Have you? Yes. Wait there. I'm going to have to come with you. <laughs> A round of applause, please, as he gets his puppet. Let's hear it. Yes. Wait there. 
I'm going to have a come with you. I'm going to have a come with both of you. Round of applause as he gets his puppet, yes. Him that, please. <laughs> I've been doing. I've, you tell him. I've, <laughs> I've been doing ventriloquism. Wait there. I'm gonna have to come with you. I'm gonna have to come with both of you. I'm gonna come with all of you. <laughs> Round of applause against his puppet, yes. Ian. What have you been doing today, Ian? Well, I've been doing juggling. They haven't. <laughs> that's uh, that's just something, isn't it? I mean, Tim is Tim's kind of on his own, and there's nobody like yeah. him. <laughs> Go ahead. I love that routine. Oh, that is fantastic. The first time he does the 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 the, 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 the thing <laughs> yeah. reminded me of what I was saying earlier about when Harry Hill did the thing. Were really, I, went, oh! I mean, you didn't see that coming no. at all. No, 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 it was great stuff. He's very he's very special. If you if you what he has his own TV uh, channel on um, on YouTube uh, TV yeah, TV, yeah. and he puts <clears throat> the, some of the most surreal abstract stuff on there which is clearly just stuff he finds funny and it's yeah. just it's so i'm so full of admiration it's so him you know um yeah i'm i'm a massive fan of him he's, yeah uh, no, it's, he's great <laughs> <laughs> he's also a big elvis fan so he's uh, he, he gets oh, my vote there too oh well there we are yeah um Right, we're, we're, we're hurtling towards the end. I will ask you some questions soon, Graham, from yeah. people that have been watching tonight. Before we do, um, we have the, the goddess of comedy. When you stop and think about Victoria Wood and, and you look at that body of work that, that she has sadly left behind, it's just stunning. Talk a yeah. little about Victoria Wood and, and what she meant to you. Well, I'd always been a fan of hers uh, from, you know, the early days and then watching the, the shows, the specials, the uh, some of the more serious uh, dramas that she was involved in, too. Um, and a huge fan. And, and she had um, just an ear that was so tuned to a certain certain wavelength of, of Britishness. Um, and... Um, lucky enough to work with her a few times on I'm sorry I haven't a clue and and uh, she was a delight to be with and very funny and her her, her own stand-up comedy uh, is as good as anybody's um, her, her dramatic comedy uh, is is great her silly comedy like Acorn Antiques is oh, wonderful that's a that's a favorite uh, of mine Acorn Antiques is uh, yeah just stands alone doesn't it so uh, in a way, she's here representing all the female comedians who are heroes of mine. And um, she, uh, in this clip, is uh, doing um, a very funny stand-up routine, which is also very visual and is bold and absolutely in your face and very funny. OK, let's take a look. Here she is, Victoria Wood. Mm. That's impressive, isn't it? Yeah, it's incredible. God, there's so much in there. The, the verbal, the visual. I mean, 
Could you do that routine? What in what in what, what, what the the comic routine or just the workout no, routine? Just physically. No. Do that. Well, that towards the end of it, that's what I was thinking. My God, she would yeah. do this every night on on yes. on the stage. She was uh, yeah. she was a huge talent, wasn't she? She was a huge talent. Yeah. Now then, um, we, this at this point, uh, Graham, I've been getting um, texts uh, throughout the oh, night. Right. All, all the questions. The first <laughs> one is rather sweet uh, that, that just came in, uh, and it's from from Tim Vine, who who evidently is oh. watching, and he says, "Blimey, need to check Graham's marbles." I'm seriously honoured that a man who made me laugh as a kid and was part of my comedy education likes my nonsense. So that's yeah. just that's just a just a lovely one for you. Well, Hello. I, I, Hi, I Tim. did wonder where you got it from. <laughs> yeah, you should take all the credit. Right, let me go back to the beginning, and we've got some very specific questions here. Uh, 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 and let's try and, because we're running out of time, we'll we'll try and get through as many of them as we can. Uh, so in that nice, you know, concise answers is, is, is what I'm saying. <clears throat> from, Mar from Martin, is stuff funny because of the rhythm and juxtaposition of words? As the rhythm and juxtaposition of words as much as the words themselves. Was this one of the reasons why, say, Willie Rushton was so good? Yes. Thank you. That was concise. Um, from <laughs> Gavin. Gavin says... <laughs> no, it, it is true. Yeah. I mean, it is very much very important. Well, uh, I know that, uh, funnily enough, the next question confirms... Our friend who we lost recently, Ian Pattinson, who, of course, yeah. was the peerless writer for Clue. Gavin says, could you share any memories about the late Ian Pattinson? Um, now, uh, the structure, because you and I talked a little bit about Ian before we came on air, and the structure and the weight and the rhythm of the joke was a big mm -hmm. thing with him. Yeah, I mean, he, he would often uh, go on Twitter and things uh, complaining about Radio 4 announcers and their grammar in the mornings. But he was meticulous in uh, using uh, grammar and uh, style correctly um, because he believed that the, the, the jokes needed to be constructed with the right balance, the right rhythm, and the words had to be placed in exactly the right place. You put the killer word right at the end of the joke where it will spring a surprise. Don't do it halfway through. And um, he was uh, very elegant in, in the prose that he wrote. And um, the, uh, the jokes that he used to write for Humphrey Littleton and then later on for Jack D, I think if, if you analyze the structure of those jokes, you'll see how beautifully written they were and uh, very elegant. Um, the reason, uh, for example, I mean, he believed, you know, words were very important. Um, he used to write the jokes about Samantha and also the jokes about Sven. And he didn't do so many jokes about Sven as Samantha. And uh, we asked him why. And he said, uh, because of the word her, it can mean belonging to her and it can mean her as a person. Uh, so he can construct a joke which, which uses the word her in a misleading way. Whereas with Sven, it's either him or his, and you can't make the same, um, play the same trick on the audience. That's, fa that's fascinating. Victoria asks, do you think any of your influences were unusual or obscure interests for your generation? Did you find you had different interests than your friends and classmates? Oh, gosh. Um, <clears throat> I suppose maybe to some extent. I think uh, at an early age, I think uh, kids all do rather like to define their own personality by finding something that they um, appreciate more than others. I mean, they also like to uh, get in and uh, enjoy everything that, that everybody else is enjoying. But I think we all identify ourselves by, by finding something that's, uh, that, that's our own. I, I think as well, if if you if you your interest in comedy is is above and beyond just enjoying it as an audience member, mm -hmm. if, if it's something you see yourself doing, I think you're more likely to seek out 
further afield than what's yeah. in front of you. Yes, and I think I didn't see myself as having a career in comedy until quite late on. And so um, I suppose in the early days, I was I was devoted to radio comedy because um, <laughs> when I started out, we didn't have a television. So um, when I was a kid, and um, so I was brought up on the people like... Uh, um, what do you call them? Uh, up the pole with uh, um, I've forgotten their names now. Anyway, uh, yeah, no um, it was a long time ago. Jewel and Morris, people oh, like yes, that. yes, yes, and of yes, course, yes. Kenneth Orne and, and Dickie Murdoch. And uh, it was wonderful to, to meet some of these people later on, Arthur Askey, people like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of rather cherished uh, the radio comedies that I, I enjoyed, which. I'm not sure that uh, the rest of my classmates at the early stage I started listening did. Was it as much of a thrill for you? I mean, Tim touched on it, Tim Vine, in, in his text when he said how thrilled he was that, that you liked his stuff as he had watched you as a kid. I remember staying up to watch the goodies. And when I got to know you, it was a thrill for me. Who, who were your you for me or who was the you that you are to me? Well, gosh, I mean, there were one or two people um, like uh, Arthur Askey and uh, Dickie Murdoch that I appeared on shows with, and that was a, a thrill. Um, big thrill was um, uh, Alistair Sim, who I'd always loved in the movies. Again, another comedy hero that we didn't have time to talk mm. about. And uh, John Howard Davis was producing a series where he played a judge, and uh, he wanted some more jokes for the courtroom scene and uh, asked me to write write a few jokes for the judge played by Alistair Sim and so I did that and went along to the read through and Alistair Sim sat at the end of the table and whenever he got to one of my lines he said uh, I can do this with a look <laughs> 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 and I said yes yes you can so, shh, out it went but I, I like to think I wrote those looks <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's very that's very funny. My last the last question from from our viewers will lead us into your final clip. Uh, what is Graham's favorite moment from the goodies? Because your last clip, your last comic hero is is your late friend, my late friend, Tim Brooke Taylor. Yeah, uh, uh, certainly a comic hero of mine uh, from the first time I saw him as a student when he made me laugh and he went on making me laugh forever. And um, I think um, I, I don't have a sort of comic moment in the goodies. I've got various sequences that I, I think worked well. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the kitten show. There's a lot of stuff in the in the movies show that uh, that I particularly like. Um, and there's a very satisfying uh, sequence we'll have a look at now, with, with, which uh, features Tim and uh, his great uh, uh, physical comedy that he could uh, deploy, as well as his uh, wonderful uh, performance of he could play scared better than anybody and uh, he could play pompous and he could play all sorts of uh, ridiculous things beautifully um, but this is the opening to a, a show we called Saturday Night Grease which was a send up of uh, the kind of movies that you might imagine. Okay well here's, here's uh, Graham's final choice of his comic heroes it is Tim Brooke Taylor. Oh, how lovely to see Tim. Yeah. And so no, much, so surprise. much, so much lovely visual, you know, slapstick -esque yeah. stuff in that clip. Graham, we've reached, well, we've gone, we've gone past our oh, time. Yeah. It's been, it's been that enjoyable. On behalf of everybody that's watching this, thank you for taking the time. And, well, thank uh, you, Rob sharing these uh, choices with us. We have to thank as well, of course, uh, over in the Netherlands, Dan van den Herk for playing along to that Laurel and Hardy clip. And I should remind people that the Slapstick Festival continues through to Sunday. So do look and see that there's, there's loads of great stuff going on that you can watch. 
Um, Graham, as ever, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to spend time in your company. Thank you, Rob. I enjoyed it. See you soon, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.